<coughs> okay. <coughs> I think we're ready to start the next session. We uh, come to attention. Um, so we're going to have three talks uh, coming up now before lunch, and the uh, first one is Susan Athey and Guido Imbens, who isn't here uh, this time, but uh, they're giving this uh, joint presentation given by Susan. Great, thanks. I'm so delighted to be here with such a terrific audience. This has been such a great conference, um, so thanks. And actually, this, this session, uh, the next three papers are all things that are sort of near and dear to my heart. So I want to talk about today about um, combining uh, methods from machine learning with methods from causal inference. And this was sort of a, a journey for me because I came into, uh, I came into my, my experiences with big data and machine learning with a very particular perspective. And through interdisciplinary work, especially working on the search engine and search advertising system at Bing, I learned an enormous amount. And I've been thinking for the last few years about how you can put together the things that I already knew with the new things that I was learning. So it, uh, to sort of uh, start out, in some sense, what, my, what, I, what I felt like I learned after a number of years of being the only person from sort of a more economics and, and social science perspective in a sea of people from machine learning um, were some, some sort of themes I felt like in terms of strengths and weaknesses from, from different approaches. So what I felt, I, I, I learned that in supervised machine learning that I felt was, was really, uh, you know, kind of missing in some sense from a lot of the work that we had traditionally done in social sciences was that there was a, just an incredibly well-developed and widely used um, non-parametric prediction methods that work very well with big data. And, you know, they've been long used in a certain set of applications, and I think it's just in the last few years that they're really getting exposure in social sciences and other areas. Um, one of the, the really big things that stands out that I found attractive was the use of cross-validation for model selection and just sort of a very rigorous and well-specified method for how you choose your models, where in economics, we generally think of that as sort of an art, or it's supposed to be given by theory, even though, you know, what sane person would have a theory about how 2,000 variables, you know, affect an outcome and in what functional form. It's completely insane, but we all sort of pretended that we did. Um, and, and that was a, a you know, huge defect um, when I started working with, with big, big data problems. You know, there's a huge focus on prediction and the application of predictions, and that's really caught up, that's really tightly wound with the, the fact that we, the, the approach of cross-validation and that cross-validation is saying, I'm going to see how well my, dot, my model is going to make a prediction for a particular observation, and I'm going to see how well it does by seeing how well my prediction matches reality. And that's, a, that's sort of a key uh, component of it. A weakness, now except for the people in this room who are the sort of leading exceptions to all the rules, is that you know, most of it is not, um, does not pay a lot of attention to causality, and especially the, you know, the, the second tier of people out there in the world who have been trained in machine learning really don't have a good language for even talking about it. And that was like a huge shock for me that people had sort of PhDs and they, they didn't, they really, the average guy coming out of an average school just couldn't even have an intelligent conversation with me about it. And that was kind of disappointing. So the people here have been working to, to really change that within machine learning, but that's still a, 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 you know, a, a generalized observation today. And in econometric social science and statistics, we have decades of experience with formal you know, theory of causality. Um, you know, there, there's one branch based on the potential outcomes method that maps very nicely onto economic approaches. We think about somebody as being potentially treated with a whole bunch of different drugs or a whole bunch of different prices, and we have a theory that says, well, they, they would have a different outcome if they'd seen a different price or if they'd gotten a different dosage of the drug. Another branch which looks very different when you read the papers but is, is in some sense conceptually similar is what we call structural models in economics. That's actually what most of my research has been on in the past until the last couple of years. Um, these are models that have a, a, more, uh, a more specified sort of functional form about the way the world works. So a lot of my research has been on auctions. I have a bunch of survey papers on my website you can read. Um, where we develop a theory, if I see somebody bidding in an auction, 
I look at them and I figure out, well, given the environment they were in, they had a certain strategy they should have been following. If I see their bid, I can infer their valuation, and then I can compute optimal reserve prices, optimal market design, um, entry, you know, in entry policies, should I have small business set-asides, and so on. And so this is a massive literature in economics. Um, Leon's going to present some work in the next session that, that fits into that literature. Um, and this is also widely used in practice. Um, merger analysis, for example, by the, the Federal Trade Commission and the DOJ use these classes of models. Um, we're going to say, I, I, I see a firm setting prices. I can figure out what their costs were. I can figure out how their incentives would change if the firms merged and how much they would raise prices. And so this is a very um, well-accepted uh, approach. And, and all you know, big consumer products firms have teams of people trained in this approach, and that's what they do to set prices. Um, so generally, there's these, these well-developed and widely used tools for estimation and inference of causal effects, often using observational data, although sometimes using experiments. And again, you're going you're, you're to use this to say, what price should you set? What would happen if I changed my prices? What would happen if I changed the minimum wage? What would happen if I changed class size? And this, this whole methodology, there's you know, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of papers using this methodology for these problems. Some of the big weaknesses, though, and this is where you know, it really hit the fan for me, is that I had a toolkit. I went into an environment with lots of covariates. I started having spreadsheets with thousands of models. This made no sense, um, and it, it really felt incredibly unprincipled. So, you know, the research agenda that, that we've embarked on um, is to then trying to grapple with these problems. Many problems in social sciences entail a combination of prediction and causal inference. Your ultimate question is causal inference, but you might have thousands of variables which are really could be thought of as predictive. Um, that you, we don't have a theory about them, and we're not interested in changing them. I might have you know, millions of patients, but their, their fundamental characteristics aren't going to change. I'm not going to give them a drug and change their age. I'm not going to give them a drug and change the climate they live in. Um, you know, th this is, I'm holding, I want to kind of hold, fix these attributes of individuals and think about only intervening on a small number of variables. And so at least in, this, in the social sciences and from what I read from machine learning, that distinction between the different kinds of variables are, is not commonly made. We run a regression. We might have a causal variable and a bunch of attributes in that regression model, but we don't treat them differently. We, 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 we use the same you know, x prime, x inverse, x transpose y, um, and we use a formula for the standard errors, and all of those are, are treating those things the same. So we want to treat them differently. Um, and then secondly, the existing um, ML approaches off the shelf are not directly optimized for the problem of estimating causal parameters. And third, inference is often more challenging for ML methods. They're designed for prediction. They're not designed for hypothesis testing. So our proposals are to formally model the distinction between causal and predictive parts of the model and treat them differently in estimation and inference. To develop new estimation methods, um, we want to be very close to machine learning when we're using machine learning, to do standard econometric approaches when we're using, doing causal inference. We don't want to invent something new when we don't need to. Instead, we want to build on the, the hundreds of thousands of papers that preceded us, but bring them together in ways that work. Um, we want to develop, a, in particular, new approaches to cross-validation that are optimized for causal inference, and that's really the focus of my talk today, as well as some robustness measures. So I'm going to start by giving a quick summary of a couple of these other papers I've been working on, and then I'll dive into, um, into this a specific example of estimating heterogeneous treatment effects. So just to start out, I'm going to introduce this sort of a potential outcomes model for causal inference. Just to define causality, what we mean is we want to know what would happen if a policymaker changed the, the policy. Yi of W is the outcome person I would have if I gave them treatment W. So if I gave them a high dose, a medium dose, or a small dose of the drug, um, this is the outcome that they would have. And so for a binary treatment, which I'm going to do for simplicity today, the treatment effect is the difference in the potential outcomes. So you think of it, every single individual in this room has a treatment effect. Um, but the problem is, the fundamental problem of causal inference is that I will never see you at this moment here in this room both with the drug and without the drug. Okay? And that's going to be my statistical problem. I'm also going to have fixed attributes of the units of study. I'm going to call them X's. And these are things I want to highlight. We want to 
in, we're going to be focusing on this distinction a little differently um, or more precisely than a lot of the literature, we want to say the units have fixed attributes, and these attributes would not change with, alter with alternative policies. For example, if I want to think about assigning minimum wage laws to states, I'm not contemplating moving coastal states inland when I change the minimum wage policy. The states are going to change. I'm going to change the policy for a fixed number of states. But by the way, there's only 50 states, so that's my population. Okay, that population is not going to change. So the first paper is a paper about inference, and actually it's really um, kind of a small data paper, not a big data paper, but it, but it was motivated by big data applications, um, but it applies to both. Um, and this is basically saying that, that in regression models, which are the most widely used models in economics and a lot of other social sciences, we've all been doing our inference incorrectly. Um, although it turns out that some of it has been the right inference for the wrong reasons. So one of the things we want to start with is we want to formally define what the question is we're asking, and that helps us highlight why we've been answering the wrong question. So we want to formally define a population of interest and how sampling occurs, and then define an estimate that answers the economic question using these objects distinguishing between effects versus attributes. So for example, my population of interest might be 50 states, or it might be the users on a search engine on a particular day. Okay? In each of those cases, I might very well see the entire population. I might see all the users of the search engine on a day. I might see all 50 states' um, income or earnings. Okay? So whatever my problem is, it's not that I'm sampling from a population. Um, I have the population, so I want to keep that in mind. Instead, we want to say, well, what data is missing, and what's the difference between your estimator and the estimate, and what makes that difference uncertain? So, for example, if I want to know, if I have a data set from 2003 that has the income of all 50 states, I actually know with certainty for that data set what the average difference was between coastal states and, and interior states. There is no sampling uncertainty. That's just a number, and it's a number that I know. And you might say, well, but I didn't really, you, you had data from 2003, but I didn't really care about 2003. I wanted to know what the average difference was for a random year. Next year. But that's actually not what we're doing. Because if we were doing that, then we would be writing in our papers about how we thought the cross-sectional variation across states relates to the intertemporal variation within a state. And of course, there's no reason at all to think those would be the same. Um, if, I wanted, if I want to use 2003 to predict 2004, it's a, it, that's a pretty stupid thing to do. If I really want to predict 2004, I might use 2002 and 2003, estimate the serial correlation, and it might be that even though you know, things change from year to year, that the difference between, you know, that, that actually states are, are highly serially correlated over time and that the serial correlation is much stronger than the cross-sectional correlation. So it would take a lot more assumptions, which nobody ever writes down, if you were really interested, if you were using 2003 to pick 2004, and that's not what people do. So I would argue that actually, you know, the real question there is something that you know with certainty. Um, and so what, what's really unknown is the causal effect of changing minimum wages. That's something we'll never know because we're never going to see both states, I mean, any state with both, uh, in both scenarios. So, you know, once we've set up this kind of framework, we then uh, re we rederive what the inference should be, and what we find is that what's commonly used, the Huber-White robust standard errors, are conservative, but they're actually the best feasible estimate for causal effects. So the way that people have normally been doing inference is fine, but for fixed attributes, like whether you're on the coast or the interior, um, the standard errors may be highly overstated um, because they're taking into account sampling variation that isn't there. So the good news is if, if you want to adopt the standard errors from our paper, all your standard errors will go down. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic that this will be a widely cited paper. <laughs> you never want to write a paper that says people's standard errors are too low. Okay. So then um, a second paper, which, which is um, j coming out in May, is asking a, di a different but related question, but also using this distinction between ca t causal variables and attributes. So here we want to look at a question of robustness of causal estimates. And I would say, you know, we came to this project inspired by machine learning, inspired by the rigor and the systematic model selection approaches for machine learning. But here we ask a question, what if you have a model? What if you're re re ready to publish? What economists and social sciences do if they're, if they're being rigorous is they might say, here's my preferred specification, 
And here's five more columns. I put in fixed effects, I took out fixed effects, I controlled for this, I didn't control for that, I changed my population. And look, my, my effect is robust across these five things. Now that makes sense, sort of, if you had 10 variables, you might have actually done an exhaustive search and basically be reporting you know, what came out of that. Now, of course, nobody corrects their standard errors for that process either, but that's another story. Um, but, you know, it's not very systematic. And if you have lots of covariates, it's just not feasible for the human brain to have really absorbed all the possible robustness checks. And so we wanted to sort of start a little bit of a, of a literature here. We've got um, a proposal that could be improved upon. But it's the, the basic idea is that we want to have a measure of robustness for a particular model. And so our proposal is that we want to um, use a series of tree models to partition the sample by attributes. So for example, we can go one attribute at a time, we can take old people and young people as the first partition. Then within each of those partitions, we re-estimate our model. Each of those will give an average causal effect. And we can average that back up across all the ways we split the sample. And depending on how you split and re-estimate it, you're going to get different average effects across all the different models. You're always going after the same thing, which is the population average treatment effect, but you can estimate it in lots of different ways, and the different ways are different partitions. And so doing this other ways would be a, an avenue for future research. And then we prefer using the standard deviation of effects as a robustness measure. And we applied that to a bunch of different past studies and found that indeed, as we had hoped, that randomized experiments tended to look very robust. It doesn't matter how you split the sample and reestimate, you're always going to get the same result. But observational studies tended to be less robust, and you were often finding, you know, when you used matching methods or so on, you weren't, you're, you're, the, the way that you specified the model might have actually made a big difference, and you, you weren't as robust as you'd hoped to be. And so here's just the proposal to social scientists would be, let's be inspired by being more systematic. Let's, let's look at the algorithms that have been used for exploring alternative specifications in machine learning and take that as an inspiration for developing robustness approaches. And so this is a first step in that direction. Now let me spend the rest of my time kind of jumping into a specific paper. Um, and this paper is really focusing on heterogeneous effects. So the first motivation, and I think um, this motivation may be the broadest in terms of interest for um, different sciences, is a motivation of experiments and data mining. So generally in medicine, if you're going to go through FDA approval, you have to pre-specify your analysis plan. You're not allowed to look at your data of 1,000 people and then figure out, okay, these three guys, the drug did really well, and they happen to be 67 years old and 68 years old and live in Montana, so therefore this drug should be approved for 67 and 68-year-olds who live in Montana. You're not allowed to do that. There's a very good reason you're not allowed to do that. That's called phishing, or that's the bad version of data mining. Multiple testing is the more formal version of it, but you can't just go look in your data and find the few people for something worked for and say that you found an effect. Okay, that's, that's bad science, it's bad statistics. However, in a world with, with lots of data and big data, it's, it's pretty ridiculous to imagine that you as a, as a doctor or you as an economist could possibly come up with a pre-analysis plan. Why would you have a theory about every possible combination? You don't know who the drug's going to work on. You can guess, but you don't know. And so in some sense, we're throwing away data and potentially people are dying over years because you might look at your data from the first experiment, find a group, and then have to run a whole new study with the right pre-analysis plan to, to find the effect you're looking for. So what we would like is a systematic method where you can look at the data after the experiment's been run, but still have valid inference to find out who on earth did this drug work for. And so we're going to deliver that. Anybody who has a randomized experiment, a randomized medical study, can use our method and discover who the drug worked for and get valid inference. So we think that's, that's important. Um, more broadly, you know, we want to understand the, tr the, the, the treatment effect function. We want to, as a, our object of interest, is how does the effect of this drug uh, vary with the covariates, with the pe people's characteristics. Um, now, that's different from the problem of finding the optimal policy, but uh, sort of inspired by social sciences, we want to be, think of having a structural function that is a, a function that says what is, the, what is the benefit of this drug across people's characteristics, what is the benefit of minimum wage across characteristics of a state. Um, and because we think the world might change, the price of the drug might change, we might discover complications later, but if we know what the benefits look like, we can do cost-benefit analysis in a wide range of settings. 
Okay. So what we're going to deliver is a model that, again, distinguishes between causal effects and attributes, that estimates treatment effect heterogeneity, and it's going to combine supervised machine learning prediction methods and causal inference tools. Um, and this is, uh, I think, a, a really novel part of the paper that I think could inspire a lot of follow-on work uh, that would improve upon what we've done, is to introduce and analyze new cross-validation approaches that are customized for causal inference. And finally, we want to, to do inference, um, as I just discussed. So just to start with, since this is sort of a broad audience, let me start by reviewing um, this, probably the simplest supervised machine learning method, the one that's easiest to understand. And it, it turns out that being simple and easy to understand is also going to make it very attractive um, for these causal inference problems. So it's a regression tree. So we have outcome yi, attributes xi. For a standard prediction tree, not causal inference yet, just for a prediction tree, what you're going to do is you take a training sample, you partition the, sam the, the, the sample into, um, into subsets, which we call leaves. We predict y conditional on a realization of x within each leaf using the sample mean. And then we go through and we keep splitting the leaves using some goodness of fit criteria, like how well you're doing predicting the outcomes. And then finally, we select the tree, tree complexity using cross-validation based on prediction quality. So if you've built a really complicated tree, but out of sample you don't predict outcomes very well, then you make the tree less complex. Okay? So we're going to build on this approach, the simplest, easy to understand, easy to interpret, um, machine, supervised machine learning approach, and try to modify it for causal inference. Here's just a picture. Um, this is a, a search engine example. This is like what the output of a tree looks like. You take the, the, the population, you divide it according to criteria, characteristics of the query, and then within each cell you take a mean and you have a certain number of observation in the leaf. Okay. So um, let, me, let me then uh, break down the overview I gave you of these tree models into a few components, and then what we're going to do is change those components. Okay? So the standard, I'm still in the standard framework. The, the things in red are the things that we're going to change. So the estimator for what is the predicted outcome is the sample mean of the outcome within a leaf. The typical in-sample goodness of fit function is a mean squared error. It's the deviation from your predicted outcome and the actual outcome. And then when you do cross-validation and you go out of sample, you use that exact same criteria, but you use it out of sample on a test sample. Um, you you, your tuning parameter is the number of leaves. There's a penalty for the number of leaves, and so what the cross-validation does is it figures out which penalty for complexity gives the best out-of-sample fit in terms of mean squared error. Okay? So now what I'm going to do is say, let's, let's modify this for causal inference. I'm going to change the estimator, the in-sample goodness of fit, and the out-of-sample goodness of fit. So again, the causal framework, um, you have the potential outcomes notation. What we're trying to do is to predict an individual's treatment effect um, but we want to predict it as a function of their observables. So tau of x is going to be the difference between the average outcome if you were treated and you have attribute x and the tr average outcome if you were not treated and you had attributes x. Tau of x, the treatment effect function, that's the object we're after, okay, for the motivations I already gave. So if I wanted to just go off the shelf and apply machine learning to this problem, let me, let me give you the two most obvious approaches. And actually, not surprisingly, since they're kind of obvious, um, people have, have taken some attacks on these before. So the first thing you could do is you could say, well, I've got a treatment group and I've got a control group. Um, let's analyze them separately. Um, and if there's a, you know, if it's a stratified experiment or if there's selection unobservables so that, you know, actually your probability of being treated depends on your attributes, we'll use propensity score weighting, which is a very standard method um, in, uh, in the social sciences. So what we're going to do is we're going to do within group cross-validation to choose the tuning parameters. So I'm like, for example, I would build a tree for treatment outcomes that's going to say how the treatment outcomes depend on x. I'll build a tree for control outcomes and see how the control outcomes depend on x, and I'll take the difference. Okay? The second approach is, well, let's just build one big tree. I mean, what we're trying to get is mu, the, the average effect, is a function of whether you were treated and your covariates. And so let's just build one big tree or one big lasso or one big random forest or one big whatever and then um, just use that function to estimate the effects. Of course, if you're building a tree and, the, and there's some parts of the tree where you don't even split on the treatment effect, then you would get an estimate of exactly zero for the treatment effect. So I'd say these are great methods, better than what we've been doing in many cases if you have a big data set, but they're not optimized for the goal. 
You haven't set out to actually choose the complexity of your models to optimize the trade-off between complexity and uh, prediction. And the second problem is that, um, and, and I, I should say with two trees or something, you're going to have a much more complex model than you need because you might have a very different partition for the treatment and the control. But the real fundamental problem here is that if you want to apply the machine learnings off the shelf, they're all built around the following idea that for each, in my test sample, I know the ground truth. In my test sample, I see your outcomes and I see your covariates, and so I can know what I should have gotten for my test sample. But of course, the fundamental problem of causal inference is that I don't know the ground truth for anybody. Okay, so I cannot take this directly off the shelf. I've got to find some other way to do it. And of course, that's probably one reason why you know, people have, have started with these methods where you, you take a prediction problem and turn it into uh, an inference problem because we know how to predict, but we don't know how to solve this other problem. Okay? So some people have looked at this. There's a bunch of people who have done things in the spirit of single tree and two trees that I just described. There's a few people who have tried, like, say, splitting trees on treatment effects. Um, but none of those actually, when they go to cross-validation, if they do cross-validation, they go back to prediction. So they're saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to split a leaf if the treatment effect is different in the two leaves. But when I see how well my model did, I'm still going to look at how well I predicted outcomes, because after all, outcomes are what I observe. I don't observe causal effects. So we're going to come up with a couple of methods to solve that problem. What you're going to see is that there's no one right answer, and I'll just preview that even our simulations and applications, one right answer does not emerge. It's going to be trade-offs. That's why there's more work to be done here. But I'm going to start with a, with a simple proposed approach. It's not going to turn out to be the, the best approach, um, but it's, it's going to actually solve this problem. And it's, a, it's an approach that's very close to propensity score weighting, but it's a little bit different. So let me start out with a very simple example. Suppose I have 50-50 randomized experiment between treatment and control. I'm going to define a new variable. That new variable is two times your outcome if you were in the treat group, and minus two times your outcome if you were in the control group. I'm going to call this Y star. OK? And so this is going to be defined for every individual. So each individual in my population has a Y star. So this Y star has this lovely property that it is actually an unbiased estimate of the treatment effect. Now, this seems a little bizarro to start with. I'm going to say that one person's outcome, <laughs> one person can give me an unbiased estimate of a treatment effect. But it's actually true. It's mathematically true. Now, it's only really useful if I take an average over multiple people. So why is that? Well, if I take the average of this transformed outcome, I'm going to get you know, positive the outcome for the treatment guys, and those are half the guys. And I'm going to get negative for half the guys, um, and multiply by two, and I'm back to my treatment effect. Okay? And this is, this is very close to propensity score weighting. Here, the propensity score is a half. But the key thing is that it, it's a small difference, but it's very important. I'm actually combining them. I'm, I'm taking one single variable for the, for the whole population, this Y star. And what that's going to give me is it's going to give me a ground truth for every individual. It's not a very good ground truth for anybody in particular. Like, you know, your outcome is not a, for you is not a good measure of your treatment effect, but it's unbiased for, for a subpopulation. Okay. So I'm going to use that as my ground truth, and, I'm gonna, and then the, the beauty of this, it's got a, lot, a couple defects, but the beauty of this is if, if you wanted to tell your student to do this, they don't have to write a line of code. They can, well, one line of code, they can write y star equals 2y if wi equals 1 and negative 2y if wi equals 0. That's one line of code. Line 2 is apply, lasso, random forest, trees, whatever in R. And they're going to have, everything is going to follow off the shelf with that. Um, and, and that's going to be very easy to do. You can generalize this if you have um, a, a non-50-50 trial, or if you have a stratified experiment, or if you have selection on observables. Um, instead of two, you know, you're going to have something like a P of X. Okay. So just to be formal, what this, what this is, then our, our, our approach, and this is sort of an, an estimation and cross-validation approach, we're going to call this conventional tree transformed outcome. Um, now the estimator within a leaf is going to be the sample mean of the transformed outcome. The in-sample goodness of fit function is going to be the deviations from the transformed outcome. So of course, every single person is going to be wrong, because I'm going to estimate a treatment effect for Leon, 
and his transformed outcome will either be you know, y or minus y, so it's not gonna be very good for Lyon, but it's uh, on average, this criteria is, an, is gonna be an unbiased estimator of the, of the goodness of fit, okay? And then out of sample, I'm gonna use the same criteria. So again, I don't actually have to write any new code for this, I just have to transform the outcome and plug it in. Everything else is the same. So there's like a really obvious dumb critique of this, which is that uh, it was nice I didn't have to write any code, but actually my estimator of the treatment effect within a leaf is kind of a dumb estimator. Because within a particular leaf, you might not have 50-50. Like if, if it was 50-50 in the population, if I gave you a sample of 10 people and said, what's the treatment effect? If six were treated and four were controlled, you would take the average of the six against the average of the four. But, but, but my method is actually not gonna adjust for the fact that it was 60-40. Um, it's gonna pretend that it was 50-50. So it's kind of a stupid estimator. It was nice, I, didn't, I could plug it in off the shelf, but it wasn't a good estimator. So what I'm gonna do in my next approach is say, well, actually, let's have a smart estimator of the average treatment effect within a, the, the leaf. I'm just gonna take the sample average treatment effect within a leaf as my estimator of the treatment effect. And if it's a, if it's a selection on observables, I'll use propensity score weighting. Everything else is the same. Now I do have to write some code now because I have to, mod I have to change what happens within a leaf. It's not, it's not hard to code, but it's, it's not a command in R. Okay. Um, but it gives a more sensible outcome. So then the last set thing that we, we try to look at a little bit more is, is actually what are some other methods we can use to, to examine goodness of fit in sample and out of sample. So just to remind ourselves, the infeasible goodness of fit would be the difference between your actual unobservable treatment effect and your predicted treatment effect. We can expand out the infeasible effect it's a squared, so we got the squared of the truth and the, the squared of the estimate, and we've got the, the interaction effect. So the squared of the truth, of course, is the same for all cried things, so it doesn't really matter for comparing models. And so the, what really matters is the square of the estimates as well as the cross term between the estimate and the truth. And so we can think about various ways we might estimate that cross term, both in sample and out of sample. If we look, um, one thing you could do is, is to actually use matching. So this, this unobservable term actually is something that could be estimated using matching. We think that's computationally bad for doing it in, inside of a cross-validation loop, but when we look uh, at the end to compare the performance of the model out of sample, we might um, use such a criteria. Another observation, and this is actually very analogous to classification problems in machine learning, uh, another example, is that um, uh, you can actually, uh, within, in sample, we know that our estimates of the treatment effect within a leaf are gonna be unbiased estimates, and they're constant within a leaf. So actually, the expected value of the product of the estimated treatment effect and the truth is just gonna be the square of the estimated treatment effect in sample, where you know that you've got, you've, you've, you fit the mean exactly. Um, and so what that tells us is that we can actually use an in-sample goodness of fit criteria, which is just the square of the estimator. And this is very analogous to using the Gini coefficient to split in classification problems. It's saying that we're gonna have a better estimator is one that has a higher variance of predictions, one that discriminates better between parts of the covariate space in terms of prediction. So it's, and so we're gonna propose for our last model that we use as, as the in-sample goodness of fit measure analogous to the Gini coefficient, just the variance of my, of my, um, of my predictions, which is gonna say, I'm gonna reward predictors that discriminate well in terms of treatment effects that say there's, these guys have high and these guys have low. And that's actually gonna perform better in practice uh, because it's lower variance than the trans out, transformed outcome. So those are the five approaches. Um, they're gonna be similar if the treatment effects and levels are highly correlated. That is, if people have a high treatment effect when they have a high outcome, but they're gonna do very badly, for example, if, if outcomes have a lot of variance but treatment effects are relatively stable. And that's actually a very common setting in the world that you know, some people might have a high chance of dying, other people have a low chance of dying, but the treatment effect differences are not as big. So we have a couple ways to compare the approaches. We can do simulations with an oracle. Um, we can use our transformed outcome goodness of fit measure, and also we can use matching to estimate infeasible goodness of fit. And in our paper, we explore um, in simulations uh, which ones do better. And generally, the fifth method is, is usually the best, but you can construct examples where others are better. 
Finally, for inference, um, an attractive feature of trees is that you can easily separate the construction of the tree from treatment effect estimation. So a tree constructed on the, sam on the training sample is independent of the sampling variation in the test sample. And so the, 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 just to, to repeat, you know, with this tree, we're going to construct a tree using attributes, and we're going to estimate treatment effects um, within each leaf. And so essentially, the, you can think of the tree construction as just a, a, a function of the covariates. It's saying, how do I split my sample? Um, and if I, do, if I estimate the tree on one sample and I do inference on the other sample, I'm going to have valid standard errors. We can't do it within the training sample because the training sample, you're going to find leaves where due to sampling variation, the treatment effect is really big. And that's, that would be the, the problem of kind of fishing. Like I find a three guys who have a high treatment effect and I'm going to call that a big treatment effect. I can't do standard errors based on that because I chose the leaf exactly because these people had tri high, high treatment effects. But in the, tr in the test sample, that's not a problem. And so it's very simple to prove that you get valid standard errors if you build the tree on a training sample and do your inference on the test sample. And that actually implies that, in fact, on the test sample, you could also use a different method of estimating treatment effects within a leaf, maybe one that was more computationally costly, um, because once you've figured out the leaves of the tree, you can do whatever you want within each leaf on the test sample. Okay? And you could use matching, you could use something that's more computationally expensive if you wanted to. I I'll just point out that the literature that shows that propensity score weighting actually works in observational studies does require additional conditions. So for example, the leaves can't get small. So the leaf size need to be bounded relative to the size of the sample for the standard errors to be correct if you're using propensity score weighting. If it's a simple experiment, um, you know, it's just standard comparison of means. Okay? So, uh, so I would, so we, we have an application to search. Um, I think I'm out of time probably to do that. What we, uh, just to say really fast, that here's a picture of what a tree looks like at each bottom node of the tree, leaf of the tree. We're going to get an average treatment effect, a standard error, and the proportion of the sample. And so what you can look at is, like, the, these are all the leaves, the effects, the standard errors, and the proportions in training and test sample. As expected, the variance of effects would be higher in the training sample because the training sample is building leaves that, that respond to variance. The test sample has a lower variance of treatment effects, and it gives you valid standard errors. We find things like, you know, if you search, so, so leaf three is, has a very low effect, that's when you searched for celebrities, and it turns out you don't click on the organic links very much, you, pick, you, you click on the pretty picture of, um, you know, Britney Spears. And so it doesn't matter how you order the organic results, while if you have kind of very purely informational queries, you have big effects of, of, ordering, uh, of, of ordering the links of, uh, of search queries. And so just to, to conclude, um, you know, the keys to our approach are, first of all, to distinguish between the causal and predictive parts of the models, to try to use the best of both worlds, um, take the really great things about the supervised machine learning people, the, um, literature, apply, combine them with the, the state-of-the-art techniques from the causal inference literature, um, and come up with standard errors, which is what the causal inference people are looking for. And I, and I do think that in practice, people should um, use this. I think that you know, we have a bunch of randomized experiments of drugs where we haven't actually gone out and spent the money to prove that it works for a certain population. And I think it'd be really important and save some lives if we went back to those studies and had a systematic and valid approach to, to use that data to figure out whose lives the drug saves. Thanks. Any questions? Yeah, really interesting work. Um, one, one of the things that's that came up here is this idea that you have the, the wrong loss function if you're doing causal inference and you're just applying a standard loss function. And to me, that evoked the work on targeted maximum likelihood estimation and that uh, you need to construct some different loss function for the, the quantity of interest and then uh, do your cross-validation with the normal loss function, but then do some kind of targeting step to uh, you know actually focus on that loss function. And that would usually involve 
uh, making the bias variance trade-off differently uh, for the model so as to have a lower bias for that particular uh, causal quantity of interest. And so that's like all the sort of Mark von der Laan kind of work. So I'm just wondering how this kind of compares to that and whether you know, that machinery has the advantage of that I can do a, a big ensemble of kind of any machine learning techniques I want as opposed to uh, constraining myself to maybe trees. Sure. So, so two points. Absolutely, that's a very, in a, in a longer talk, actually, that's the sort of next related literature slide. So that's absolutely very similar in spirit. I would say, actually, there's no, I should have emphasized this more, but there's no constraint to trees, um, especially with the transformed outcome approach. Any method will work. Um, and so I think here we're trying to, to focus on, you know, getting, um, you know, getting the heterogeneous treatment effect approach and, and what's going to be very optimized for solving that problem. But I would say that they're similar in spirit. Maybe we can follow up offline about details. Yeah, it would be interesting to, to see a direct comparison with those methods, especially since there's sort of some provable efficiency guarantees about the um, TLM, MLE. So. That's right. So, so here in some circuits, so we're going to be, you know, able to use uh, efficient estimation. Um, I mean, we'll, we'll have sort of efficient estimators within leaves, but the the efficiency of the entire algorithm is not uh, is not established. 